If you're tweeting about this session, my handle is at AAInfoPro. But when I think about robots, when I hear that word, I think about things like Rosie from the Jetsons or the creepy robot from Lost in Space there with Dr. Smith. And that's not really what we're talking about when we talk about search. Search robots are more things like the algorithms or the search engines that we've always relied on in doing research as librarians. So I'm sure you've seen a lot of these headlines that have been out there. Will robots take your job? Humans ignore the coming AI revolution at their peril. Will robots take your job? It depends on where you live. Beware tsunami effect of artificial intelligence. Will a robot take your job? At least one third of Phoenix area positions are vulnerable. Does anyone here from Phoenix? <laughs> Nobody, okay, we're all safe then. <laughs> um, Robots will take our jobs and we need a plan for scenarios for the future. Now, I like that one because even if we have a little skepticism about being replaced by a robot, it is important to take this seriously and think about how will we plan for the future when everything is going to be robotic. The robots are coming and they want your job. Are robots coming for your job? Eventually, yes. Now, after I prepared this PowerPoint and uploaded it to the conference website, I saw another headline in the Wall Street Journal a few weeks ago that said, robots will end up goofing up just like the rest of us. <laughs> so not to worry, we're fine. I, what I've read in the literature a lot about this is, has said that how do you know if you'll be replaced by a robot? Well, they've said that if you can easily explain what you do, you can be replaced by a robot. And I would argue that as librarians, we can't easily explain what we do. I think it's complex and nuanced, and, and I don't think it's straightforward because we really have a value add that we bring that's not easily explained. And just a, a sh quick story, how many people here are from public libraries? Okay, great, because this is a public library story and it involves my mom. Uh, she's retired, she volunteers at a small rural public library. It's a town of 4,000 people. So what she does, and she's been doing this for a few years, she's entering all the obituaries from the town newspaper from the beginning of the town to now. So she started in about 1870 and she's at about 1922. <laughs> so she was at her job volunteering, typing in these obituaries and she overheard someone speak speaking with the reference librarian, and this person said they had taken an Amtrak train to this town to research their family history. So they didn't have a lot of materials for things like that. This woman had traveled a few hours to do this. The librarian was trying to help her. And my mother overheard her mention the name that she was researching. And it's a common name, but it was sort of an odd spelling. And my mom thought, I know these people in the town. So she called her friend and said, I'm at the library. There's this lady here. She came here on a train. She has your last name. It's spelled the same way. Would you mind if I give her your phone number to call you? So the guy said, no problem. My mom gave the lady this number. She talked to this guy for like an hour. He was able to put her in touch with like cemetery plots and all kinds of things that she wouldn't have previously known about. And, and that was, so that was hugely helpful to this woman. And could a robot have done that? <laughs> I don't think so. Um, so. Similarly, Stephen Abram always gives this example when we talk about the value that we add as librarians. The, the mother who's going to be divorced and a single mom, and, and what does she do? She comes to the reference librarian and says, I just need you know, some numbers of, of divorce attorneys or something. But that's really not all that she needs, but you don't know that at first. And I think going back to the reference interview, it's so critical. And we learn that in library school, and I use it every single day in my work. And, and so I think we don't know what people want until we really start talking to them. And that's not a robotic process. It's the same thing with tax forms when people come in, they want to know about that. It, that's not really all that they need is just a tax form. Or the Affordable Care Act when people need to know about that. They don't need to just know there's the website, click here to sign up. It's really complicated and they need help navigating that. So I think that we just don't know how we can help our patrons, our customers, our clients until we hear their stories. And a robot, I'm not sure, is that good at listening to a story and really understanding what needs to be done. Robots in libraries, <laughs> I, I, it's in artificial intelligence. That's really what they're calling it, AI. So how do we know when we're looking at something like that? Well, MIT built this 
flow chart to, to determine if something is using AI. So they're saying that if it can see, hear, read, move, or reason, it's using AI. So really, all the databases we've used all along as librarians really do those things because whether you're typing something in in a Boolean search language or natural language, it is seeing what you type and they're saying it has to see. And they say that it uses what they call computer vision and image processing to see it and process it. Or it's reading what you've typed. And they call it responding usefully and sensibly. And, and they use language processing to do that. So really that's something that we've always done since we began searching online databases. But it, there's a difference because of the way that these are being built now. So that's really what I want to talk about is I just want to give some examples of reference products and questions that I've worked on and how they've come out and how I thought that maybe if we were building a better robot, a better search engine, they could be handled differently. So. The first example I have is a US code site. Now, this is something that someone comes to you, they wanna see this US code, they have the site. We've all probably done this, you type it in, the database pulls it up. So, the example I had was 15 USC 1666 FA. So, somebody wanted to see that code, that was the beginning of their question. So, easily, I type it in, this was Westlaw, it brings it up, okay. Well, the problem is, that's not all they wanted. They wanted to know, at what point in time was this cash discounts paragraph added to the code? And that's really not that easy to determine because you have to figure out on your own sort of piecing together each year that it's changed to figure out when it occurred. So if you look at this, there's this, what they call the credits field where all those dates are. This, code section originated in 1968, but then it was changed a bunch of other times and the dates are there. So what I had to do was look up this code in all these years, do a search for cash discounts and see if the paragraph was there. So I got lucky in that 1974, the second change had the cash discounts paragraph, so I could easily tell the person, looks like 1974 is when they put that in. But the problem is, you could have a law that had 40 different changes, and you might be looking at 40 searches, and if option 39 has your term, you just wasted a lot of time and did 40 searches for something that doesn't seem that complicated. So to me, I just feel like, if this were a better robot, the search engine, couldn't we say, I'm gonna highlight verbiage I wanna see, just tell me the year? That seems like a basic thing for a robot that would be good, but no can do on that one. Oh, so my next example was somebody that came to me and said they wanted to search company charters for certain terms in certain years but they only wanted to see companies with, that were not in an SIC code that started with six. So, okay. I thought, that's fine, I'll, I'll go to Westlaw. I know it's an SEC filing company charters. Well, the first thing is they don't call them company charters. So if you log onto Westlaw, Westlaw Business, and, and look for an SIC filing and say I'm looking for company charters, it just doesn't know what you're talking about. So. Shouldn't the robot know what that really means is articles of incorporation since the robot should be working for this database? It doesn't know it. So that's the first thing you have to figure out. So it's not that hard. You can go to Google and figure it out. But still, I'm thinking, can't the, why can't the robot do that? So <laughs> you get to that section. You search articles of incorporation. I was able to figure out how to type in my free text search because I found this connectors and expanders section. So they were looking for ownership limits. So I did owner exclamation point within two of limit exclamation point. I typed in my date range. So then I get to the SIC code part. And I thought, okay, they want no companies that are in SIC code starting with six. Well, there's that percent sign, but not. I thought, great, I'll just say, but not SIC code six group, which that was, took a little sleuthing. I had to figure out, you have to type in a six with three asterisks, you can't do an exclamation point, that wasn't working. So I do the but not, I think I'm good to go, and I get this weird error that just says, can't, can't process this. So I didn't know why I was getting that. So I called the helpline at Westlaw, and they said, oh, you're doing a field because 
as you can see, there's that field there for SIC, SIC CD. They said, if you're doing a field, you can't uh, use the, a connector like that. So I thought, all right, I'm gonna go in the back door then. So I thought, all right, I'm gonna search for all SIC codes except the six. So that's what I had to do. I had to type all of them in. So a zero, a one, a two, I, 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 I had to figure out what are all the SIC code numbers that begin SIC codes and just leave the six out. So it was able to do that, but I had to figure it out, not the robot. And then the other thing, then they, so I gave them their results and they said, oh wait, I also forgot to tell you, I wanted market capitalization that's over $7 million. So I thought, okay, not too bad. There's a way to do that. I type it in. The problem is, and the market cap there, when you start choosing those categories, Westlaw translates them into numbers. So then when you go to the search, in the market cap section there where it says MCAP CD, it changes them to a two, three, and a four. So the problem I have is if I give this to the requester, they're gonna say, what is, why are you searching two, three, and four? So then I have to explain, well, this database changes that to two, three, and four. So I told them that, that was fine, you know, I was good to go, but I thought, that's a lot for me to try to figure out. Couldn't I just say, I don't want anything in the SIC code group of six, but I couldn't. Docket searching is another uh, area where I'd like to see some robotic activity. Uh, I search dockets a lot. I don't have a law degree, so I get really confused easily. I don't really know what I'm looking for sometimes because I don't know how to translate it into the legal verbiage that you need. So the New York Times has this AI glossary and the URL is there in blue if you want to check it out. And they call machine learning systems that learn from data sets to perform and improve upon a specific task. It's the current area of AI experiencing the biggest research boom. So remembering what you do and trying to help you based off what you typically do. So I retrieve dockets a lot and I always need the last amended complaint. The problem is sometimes the dockets are huge and the last amended complaint is way at the bottom and, you, and I don't know which number it would be because I don't know how many there are in total. So I'll just do a control find on the docket sheet for amended complaint and just keep paging through. So if, like Bloomberg Law, which is what I usually use, if it was actually machine learning, you would think it could just have like a little clippy or some kind of little icon person saying, hey there, Amy, you usually want the last amended complaint. Here it is on the stocket. That's what my wish list for the robot at Bloomberg Law. Another thing with dockets is, I search for a lot of complaints, and the people that I work with will say, I want to search for all complaints where company X is the defendant and the case is about whatever. So that's fine, except they don't have a file of complaints. So first you have to get the dockets with your company as the defendant and then figure out if they seem relevant and then pull them up and go to the complaint. And again, I'm paging through to get to the final last amended complaint. So it would be nice if you could just say, in the complaints, which ones have company X as a defendant? If it's actually understanding what they're calling natural language processing, I would be able to just say that. Because they call that the discipline within AI that deals with written and spoken language. So it, it should be able to understand our language. You know, a layperson's language in, in legal research, like I oftentimes am looking for the motion to dismiss or the final opinion and or, order or settlement documents, but none of them are called that. It's not gonna say this is a settlement document. It'll say something I don't really understand and then I'm just sort of lost trying to figure this out. Another thing I do a lot is look for expert reports because the company that I work for uh, provides PhD economists to testify as experts at trials. So a lot of times we wanna find the reports of our opposing expert in previous cases to see sort of how they work. But expert reports are never called that. <laughs> They're called like exhibit 16 in some other document that has nothing to do with it at all. So I've actually a lot of times had to open 50 exhibits and look at them and see is that the expert's report because the keyword search sometimes just doesn't work properly to find the exhibits that have the expert reports. So I wish the robot there, if I could just say, where are the expert reports, it could find them. Oops. Explainable AI, 
The New York Times calls AI that can tell or show its human operators how it came to its conclusions. And this is so critical in the business in which I work because we go into a courtroom and we always have to explain how we found what we did, how we know that we've looked everywhere, how we know that the database was comprehensive. So we need to know that the database is comprehensive. So this is why we would never use relevance ranking because that a lot of times is what they call a black box algorithm. It's when an algorithm's decision-making process or output can't be easily explained by the computer or the researcher behind it. So I'm the researcher behind it. So if I can't really explain what it's doing, I can't use something like that. And actually, so Phaedra this morning at the keynote, she said, never trust AI that isn't fully transparent. And I wrote that down because I thought, it's never fully transparent. I thought, what AI is fully transparent? Not, not our research databases that we use. I have no idea. Do we, is Google fully transparent? Do we know how they're coming up with their results? We just don't know. So that doesn't seem like that good of a robot for right now. Machine learning combined with natural language processing, this would be ideal for research because take something, for example, like US public laws that are not really called what we all call them. So for example, like the Brady Bill or Obamacare or um, the bank bailout bill in 2008. That it's actually the Financial Institutions Reform Recovery and Enforcement Act, but we all call it the bank bailout bill. So, and I'll, to be fair, Lexis sometimes has put together files with the common name, like they had a savings and loan bailout file, I have to admit, back in the late 80s, <laughs> that they had this file and you could look at it that way. And I know it's not that difficult to go to Google and find the real name, but you know, a basic good robot here would, would know when I say Obamacare, which law I'm talking about. So it would combine the two and be able to find these things easily. And also understand the topics you're researching. Like if I'm researching hotels at my job, I don't want a bunch of Yelp reviews or beg, bed bug reports or things like that. I'm looking for financials, competitors, bankruptcies, market share. So if it could just remember through machine learning <laughs> that I'm looking for the hotel industry as, as a business, not as a vacation destination, that would be really helpful to me. So those are just some examples that I wanted to share about building a better robot, and now I'm gonna turn it over to Tara.